the sharp edge of these issues. I've been following him now on social media. Time to introduce him to you if you have not yet met him. Mohammed, thanks for uh, joining us and congratulations on some uh, great work, uh, including schooling uh, the multimillionaire uh, Piers Morgan on the multi-billionaire Rupert Murdoch's uh, television uh, show. Tell us, first of all, what that was like. Well, thank you for that. And I wanted to actually congratulate you as well um, for your indefatigability, the word that you use all the time, and your resilience, in fact, your patience and your courage on this issue, on the Palestine issue. I think that um, you, the, you. the community has noted, the community has noted that you have been a close ally uh, on these matters, and we really respect uh, um, your work on the Palestine issue. I think that your work I th in the last 20 years is probably in the United Kingdom context, the most notable work, and your resilience and strength against some of the far right elements of our society has also been noteworthy. So I wanted to put that to you. Thank um, you. Second thing, in terms of peers, thank you. Yeah, in terms of peers, I I, I would categorize him as a, as a person who is um, who has heavy hands but a, a glass jaw, in the sense that if you really put him, <laughs> if you ask him questions, if you you know in a corner, he will find it difficult to answer the questions that he likes to ask everybody else. Um, and the reason for that is is simply because he 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 doesn't actually have. He's not morally consistent. He's only strategically consistent. You mentioned yourself, his uh, kind of connections with uh, Rupert Murdoch and uh, all these kinds of organizations that he's worked with. Uh, it has been said that the reason why he's acting in this way, and he can't bring himself to condemn the killing of civilians in Gaza, the most, one of the most populated areas in the world with civilians, is because he knows that that will get under the skin of his, uh, his masters. Uh, which shows lack of backbone, it shows lack of integrity, uh, that he's not integrous, he's not morally um, principled in that manner. Uh, and in fact, it shows that he's he's not, he doesn't have a moral compass uh, and that anyone could uh, maybe give him money uh, to say whatever he they want him to say. I'm afraid that's true. But you put him behind the eight ball uh, as Americans uh, who play that vulgar game of pool uh, will recognize. Uh, you snookered them, as we would say, in the United Kingdom. Uh, when you turned the question round, you asked him, will you condemn the Israeli Defense Force killing of thousands of Palestinian children? And he couldn't even answer that. Exactly. No, I mean, he hasn't even answered that, even after that uh, interview. And the reason why it's, it's very clear for anyone to know and see is because of his ideological and or financial uh, commitments. I mean, if we're being honest about the situation, right? I mean, if we say that killing a child, I mean, this is a very simple argument. I mean, we can make it. Killing a child, whether Palestinian or Jewish, Arab or Jewish or black or white, whatever it may be, is a bad thing, okay? Uh, so killing one black child, killing one white child is, is, is equally bad. Killing one Palestinian child, killing one Jewish child is equally bad then it would make sense then, using that kind of logic, that the more children that you kill, the worse it is. And so the IDF has been killing more children, therefore they've been, they're, they're worse than any, um, anyone else in, the, in this conflict, whether, whether one's, one wants to invoke Hamas or Hezbollah or any other entity, Islamic Jihad. If we're talking about the killing of civilian death, there's no doubt that there's been more, you've mentioned it before I came on, civilian deaths that have been killed from the Palestinian side, and historically, from the uh, disengagement in 2006 of, of Palestine, the so-called disengagement, because in fact, they've still maintained effective military control in, in, in international relation, in international law terms. Oh. Um, in 2006, all these operations that they've conducted from caste led to protective edge, and every three to four years, what they call mowing the lawn or killing the people or subduing the populations there, uh, if we're just counting bodies, effectively, if we're just counting bodies, there's no way anyone can make an argument if you believe that the human life of a child who is a Jew and the human life of a child who's an Arab is equal, that baby is equal to that baby, this race is equal to this race. There's no one, uh, no way anyone can make an argument that in fact, um, that any other party other than the IDF is, is most criminal here. 
Now, uh, when I started uh, in this cause in 1975, precisely, uh, you could have fitted all of mm. the people who were ready to say they were with the PLO uh, into this room that I'm sitting in, which is not very large, and room for a, an elephant at yeah. the back of it, uh, at the worst mm. of times. Uh, now, Hyde Park uh, could not contain all of the British people who want to take to the streets and demonstrate their support for Palestine. And if you add those they left at home who can't or won't go on demonstrations and so on, now we are millions and millions in the United Kingdom. And we are now producing, uh, as if from nowhere, uh, people of the eloquence of you and the courage of you, and there are many of you now, I'm seeing them, not least on, on Piers Morgan. Uh, I mean, low key, uh, I mean, he's United Nations class, he's world class. Uh, and, you know, when I first knew him, he was a rapper. Uh, now he's a political statesman. In other words, what I'm saying is we're growing uh, in, in quantity, but we're also growing in quality. And new leaders, new speakers like you are coming forward. You've expressed uh, similar uh, thoughts I saw today uh, and made the point that it is causing some consternation amongst the establishment, that people they bring on, maybe thinking there'll be a punch bag, turn out to be brilliantly eloquent and informed. This is new, isn't it? Absolutely. First of all, thank you for all the compliments. I, I really do uh, appreciate them. The new guard cannot have done what they're doing unless the old guard, uh, which is people like yourself, in fact, done what they've done. And uh, it's no doubt in, in my mind, I remember being a, you know, a child in, in, in secondary school or a teenager and, uh, and seeing your coverage and your responses, for example, to the 2006 war in Lebanon. And the way you there was a particular reporter that you really put on the back foot doing exactly the same things and techniques that I've employed. So once again, I thank you for the compliments, but um, I have to put to you as well that you've laid the foundations actually for this, which shows you the importance of intergenerational work. In terms of the PLO, I think it's good that you mentioned them because the PLO it really represent an organization that have tried with the peace talks and that have tried going through, you know, the Oslo Accords and these kind of things. And uh, lo and behold, what we're finding is that the Palestinian issue, even though there have been non-violent attempts to try and resolve the situation, have not found resolutions. I mean, we talk about the Oslo Accords, but people don't realize because now Hamas, for example, is being used as a scapegoat that there are, for example, the West Bank, is bereft of uh, Hamas. There is no Hamas in the West Bank. They, they have no uh, effect there at all. And yet, and we have the Palestinian Authority there, which the PLO was part of and then became the PA. Um, still, you have 44 p children being killed in this year alone, according to UN reports, children before the conflict emerged. And so what we're, we're seeing is Palestinian life is is being is being cheapened by by people uh, in this country. It's being uh, it's being seen as lesser than. And in fact, uh, I think this is what we're we're facing. We're facing actually. You talked about race before you came on. There was a segment talking about your own anti-racial politics. I have to put to you that I think that if you believe in an apartheid system, which many people are saying we support Israel and these kind of things. I don't know to what extent they support Israel, because if they support Israel unequivocally and comprehensively and in everything that they do, then they should also they, they would be implicit, uh, complicit in supporting Israel and their racism as well. I and mean, there is an apartheid system, not just according to Human Rights Watch and B'Tselem and uh, Amnesty International and even bodies of the UN. But if you look at the law, because in 1973, there was a, the UN had an apartheid convention. And of, of the things, conditions, there was eight conditions that were laid down. One of the conditions that were laid down for something to be called apartheid is that uh, it would have to be, uh, it would have to have laws that discriminate on the basis of race. If one just takes one example, which is the right of return law, the Aliyah, it effectively says you have the right to return if you're, if you're a Jew, okay? And if you convert, by the way, to Christianity or to Islam, 
uh, that right of return is actually uh, is relinquished or is, is rescinded or whatever it may be. And so you lose the right to return if you convert. This is just this example alone, which no one can deny because it's entrenched within the, the, the statute books of Israeli law. This example alone, it shows you clearly that Israel is an apartheid state, just in the same way as South Africa was. In fact, there's a very good book that was written on this uh, topic about the secret um, allegiance between Allah, uh, b- between South Africa and, and Israel. The, the, the point being here is that you have people like Piers Morgan who claim to be anti-racist. You have people across the political spectrum who claim to be anti-racist, but then they talk about supporting Israel unequivocally. And I don't see how that actually works. How does it work when you've got when you've got communities of people, Palestinian people, who are being uh, imprisoned in the West Bank without any... You've got, ch- you've got a thousand children in, in, in prisons in the West Bank. I mean, you have yeah. Um, yeah. you have p- children being killed, as we've mentioned. We, we, have all, we have Gaza, we have the blockade going on. And there's a reason why Gaza and the West Bank are not part of uh, an Israeli state. Not that we're proposing a one-state solution, but that w- this should be put on the table, that if Gaza with a 2.2 million population and, and the West Bank with a 3.2 uh, million population of uh, Arabs were consumed into an Israeli state, you'd have a majority of Arabs actually in Israel. And if you have a Knesset which has a PR system with proportional representation, then they couldn't they couldn't do this. So, in order to try and subjugate the Palestinians, they can't have them as part of the state. They can't have a two state solution. So they effectively have to have them between two uh, situations. A uh, situation A is uh, they can't be part of the state, and situation B is they can't have their own statehood. So. Here, this is, if not apartheid, uh, even worse than actually apartheid, because I don't think South Africa had this state of affairs where, you know, 10,000 people were killed in 22 days in this in this way. Uh, and so people that are on this side of history, that they're talking about sp- supporting Israel's right to defend itself, and, and that's all they're talking about, and they won't even bring themselves like peers to condemn Israel. I have to ask the question, I mean, how could you support, how could it be conceivable? How is it intelligible? How is it conceivable? How is it conceptually possible to believe, to support unequivocally a state like Israel and and not to, to, to be racist? Because to, to, to be an apartheid supporter, is it not a prerequisite to be a racist? That you believe it's legitimate to discriminate on the basis of race. And I think this should be the new narrative. The new narrative should be if, if one has unequivocal support, and that is a big conditional because not many people have unconditional support but if people have unconditional support to the state of israel they should be questioned about whether or not they actually are racist people well the leader of the labor party the leader of her majesty's opposition used exactly yes. your word unequivocal my support for mm. israel is unequivocal and that same person uh sir kid starva Uh, said that Israel had the right to cut off water, electricity, and food from the occupied territories. And he is a king's counsel. You couldn't get a more senior lawyer than him. Now, unless he's masquerading as a lawyer, he obviously knew that Israel did not have the right to do this. That to do this would be unequivocally illegal. But he still supported them. And he's the leader of the Labour Party. I have seen him come out and try and retract some of those statements or try and clarify them. But you're right. In the first instance, it was quite clear what he said on LBC radio. And this is a scandal, if if anything could be said about it at all. It's a, it's a scandalous state of affairs for someone like Keir Starmer, who's, by the way, I mean, in terms of the Muslim population, um, cancelled um, uh, iftar events that he had in, in Ramadan. He has shown the cold, cold, cold shoulder to the Muslim community, uh, complete disrespect. I can't see how anyone would, from the Muslim community after this would vote for him or vote for his party. He's really alienated the Muslim community. And with this, his support, as you mentioned, using the term unequivocal, then I would question him on this very matter. I'd say, look, there's laws that are entrenched. We're not even talking about issues that can be disputed. Like, for example, the El Hilal uh, uh, Mustashfa, the, 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 the hospital in Gaza, where they said that that was misfiring of this or that, which is a ridiculous proposition anyway. But these things, there's a level of, let's say, um, 
insignificant doubt that one's, one can employ. But when we talk about laws which are entrenched and one can refer to them, they're digitized and they're online, like the right of return, the property, the absentee property laws, which allow a disproportionate ability for, for example, uh, Israeli or Jewish people in, in, in West Bank and other places to, to effectively seize property that would otherwise be for Arab people. The settlements and these kind of things, which have been consistently said to be um, against international law. And then after that, the killing of civilians and the war crimes that have been committed, which go against Geneva 4, which go against uh, all kinds of principles in international law. If people can't speak up about these kind of things, we must question their integrity. We must question whether or not they're, they're racist. Because as I say, is, I, I want to know how it's possible if apartheid is defined as discrimination, or at least a prerequisite of it is discrimination based on race. How could it be possible for a people to support a state which is effectively an apartheid state without having as a prerequisite of that an accept or a legitimization of uh, racial politics or racism, racism in politics or racism in, 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 in law? So they should be questioned. And I think this is a way in which um, I, we will separate the men from the boys directly. I mean, how, do you support these apartheid laws or do you condemn them? And that's another question we can ask them. Can you Do you support the, the right of return, which is uh, only for Jewish people? Do you support the, the laws on, uh, for example, property, which which are discriminatory to, to Arabs? Do you support the settlements? Do you support the war crimes? You support, because once again, all these things show that these, the international establishment is moving towards uh, racism effectively, which is cheapening the lives of the Palestinian people comparative to uh, Jewish people. And this is, uh, I think, it's actually scandalous. Mohammed, your job, you've been marvellous. I knew you would be. Thanks for joining us.